Well, we're at it again. Going fishing. Fishers of men, to be honest. Here, fishy, fishy. Let's get caught up. Let's get her pots out of here. Let's go. Let's get out of here. How you guys all doing? What's going on? At the time of this recording, it's a Saturday night live stream in my time zone. And I'll put my fishies away. Of course, uh, we're looking at uh, Pisces and the, the church representing being represented in the fish. And I've got a couple little side studies here that I thought was really just fun. Really fun connections. Hey, everybody. Hey, Laura. Hey, Morgan. I know. You know what? What else would you rather do on a Saturday night? You know, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about his soon return. That's what I'm interested in right now. So uh, I've got some study stuff to share and we'll bounce around and I will, I, I really want to read the comments as I'm going live, but when, every time I share screens, it's hard for me to read the comments. So um, I'm going to try though. I'm going to try. So um, where do I begin? Jarrett from Supernatural by Design. I think that's the first thing I'll say. The, shout out to Jarrett. And because um, he brought up some a really interesting connection and he kind of lightly touched on it. I'm like, okay. So I went a little bit further into it. And he, he but he touched on it a little bit. So, um, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and start with that theme first. And then I'm going to get into some scriptures and stuff like that and bounce around. Maybe I'll say some things that I've said in the past. Not quite sure. But let's get into it. The first thing that I wanted to show you was that I'll show, I'll show you this first. So here's our eclipse. And if you notice, uh, Uranus is in Aries, okay? So that planet is in the back foot of Aries every 84 years. I mentioned this before, okay? So this was uh, this year, 2023, April 20th. But it, it sits there for about a year. And it goes through all the constellations and it comes back every 84 years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share actually another screen so I can bounce around here a little better and um, and then go and show you what I'm going to say here. So I'm going to show you this way and here we go. So this is 2022, November 8th, and there's a blood moon right beside Uranus in the heel of Aries. Okay, so that's 2022, November 8th, blood moon right here in Aries. If you backtrack 84 years from that, 1938, we have a blood moon right beside Uranus in the heel of Aries. Okay, so this is 1938, November 7th, an exact 84 years before 2022. Okay, so we got a blood moon in Uranus, the heel of Aries in 2022, November 8th. And then we've got a blood moon in the heel of Aries, 1938, November 7th. So I think what's happening here, in my opinion, I think God is basically saying this is important. This is an important sign. This is an important picture. And it's an 84-year gap. And we're going to get into, this, like I said, some Bible in a second. But God highlighted that picture here. And I think he, he did it with a solar eclipse as well. So... If you go from 2023, we've, we had a solar eclipse right beside the bands of Pisces in 2023, April 20th. You subtract 84 years from this date, and we have a solar eclipse in 1939, April 19th. Okay, so we have a solar eclipse, again, 2022. Sorry, 2023, April 20th, which is a couple weeks ago. And 84 years ago, we had a solar eclipse in the exact same spot. So we have a solar eclipse 84 years apart, I think giving us a really important timestamp here. And then we have a blood moon 84 years apart in the heel of Aries. Um, so that's perfect. So I think what's happening is here is God is saying, okay, this last generation this fig tree generation, I'm giving you a timestamp here. I'm giving you a picture. So I I love the connection here of, again, the blood moons in Uranus. And I'll show you one more time here in 2022. 
November 8th. And it's also 1938, November 7th, the blood moon there in the heel. And then we've got this eclipse, 2023, just passed. In Pisces, right where the nebula IC153 is. 84 years before that solar eclipse, we had another solar eclipse in this exact same spot, 1939. And then just, just, um, just so you guys know too, you minus 84 years from that, and Uranus is in the heel of Aries. Okay, it doesn't really matter. I'm just, I just picked May 1st as a general date. I'm just showing you that 84 years before the other eclipse, there's Uranus again in Aries. 84 years before this is 1771. There it is. Once again, just like clockwork, Uranus means heaven in Greek. Uranus. Every time you see the word Uranus in the New Testament, it means heaven. And there it is again, 1687. 84 years ago. Uh, so basically, you just keep on subtracting 85, 84 years, and you're in the heel of Aries. It's a very, very consistent uh, thing, just like clockwork. Okay. All right. So uh, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So that's really, really interesting. All right. So you could just keep on doing the math. Like that's what I was doing earlier on. And also, the solar, there's solar eclipses. That's another thing too. I, I could show you where the solar eclipse is. I don't really have to, but we could go through all those detailed years, but all the solar eclipses, there's solar eclipses. There's in the first two years, it's in Pisces and the rest of the time it's in uh, Taurus. So I think the whole point is these eclipses are, I think, just outlining this really important picture in the stars right here. Uh, Every 84 years, the eclipse was either here or it was right over here in Taurus. And then there was the blood moons in Uranus. And every time there was a blood moon in Uranus, the sun was always in on the opposite side in Libra. So in order to make that blood moon happen, the sun's got to be at opposition. So it was always in the head of Libra on those blood moons. So that's another consistent thing there. Okay, so... All right, so that's that's uh, the first thing that I wanted to say was just that real cool connection that was really inspired by Jared. And then he also brought up Anna, which I'm going to get into at some point here. Um, and then we might revert back to these pictures. I love keeping this picture up as I'm talking about the Bible because it's almost like I'm reading a, <laughs> a children's book or something. Uh, and you just there's a picture that goes along with the text of the Bible, and it just always makes it more exciting. So... I, I kind of like to have it a, on a freeze frame of uh, of our potential weekend that's around the corner. And I'll, I'll make it look a little bit nicer here. And then we'll get some Bible out and we'll bounce around a bit. So there we go. We'll leave that up. And uh, we'll get to it here. All right. So I asked in my shorter video today about uh, some people that, you know, if you have any bread connections and a few people men wrote some comments and it led me into different studies. Sometimes somebody says one thing and then I jump all over the place. So uh, Jeannie D, I think she was the one that led me to look at Luke 11. And then I just kind of spiraled all over the place. So that's kind of what I titled this video, Ask, Seek and Knock. But before I get into Luke 11, well, we got to go back. We got to go to Luke 10. So... Luke 10 is, he sends out the 70, and he says, go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among the wolves. So he's always using lambs and bread and fish in his stories, and he's sending out the lamb, and they're going on a long journey, and they're going out to preach the Gospels. And then later on in Luke 10, what does he say? Well, I'll read verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So here we are looking at the skies once again. Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Remember the lightning, the seven thunders, Pleiades. So it connects with that story once again. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents. And Cetus is known as the sea serpent as well, right? So it's sometimes we can call it the great whale, but it's also called the sea serpent. So the, the scripture says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents. To trample on serpents. How do we trample on serpents? We trample because we've got the power of the, of the blood of the lamb. 
And like uh, Dr. Barry shared in older depictions, this this lamb had its right hand on the restrainer. Too. So it, this lamb tramples on the sea serpent. But also it says, I gave you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy and nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Okay, so scorpions and serpents. So here's your sea serpent. Here's the power of the blood of the lamb that conquers everything. But over here, we've got scorpions and we've got a full moon basically in uh, on our rapture we're again we're guessing we're always guessing guys but our rapture weekend next weekend here's a full moon here and then the next day it's in scorpius it's in the scorpion so this story in luke 10 behold i give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions well here's the scorpion and it's being uh, highlighted by the moon. And here's the serpent. And here's the blood of the lamb. And he mentioned lambs in Luke 10, verse 3. And so that's really cool. And then we read on. And it, we bump into the parable of the good Samaritan. So let's read some of that. And see if we can make some connections with what we see in the stars and this this theme of second passover a certain man went down from jerusalem to jericho and fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing wounded him and departed leaving him half dead now by chance a certain priest came down the, that road and when he saw them he passed by on the other side likewise a levite when he arrived at the place came and looked and passed by on the other side but a certain samaritan as he journeyed that's connected with second passover second passover is all about a journey and um anyway he came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion so he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine and he set him on his own animal brought him to the inn and took care of him on the next day when he departed he took two denarii so a denarii was worth one day's wage which meant he was likely going to come back in two days a day is like a thousand years. So there you go. The two denarii can relate to the 2,000 years since Christ. Uh, but not only that, going back to verse 33, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. So this is all about a journey. But moving on, back to 35, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So this theme is Jesus, again, he's coming again. John 14, verse 3, Jesus says, I'm coming again. And so we've got this really nice theme with second Passover in Luke 10, uh, 30 through 35. And so if we read on here, now we're with Mary and Martha, worship and serve. And um, this is Luke 10. Well, we can just read 38 through 42. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So at his feet. <clears throat> In some of the live streams, I've said um, Jupiter is always, in my opinion, represents the character within that story. So, for example, in the book of Revelation, uh, Jupiter would be John at the feet of Jesus in Revelation 1. In the book of Joshua, I think it's chapter 5, when Joshua meets the commander of the army, he bows down at his feet. And there you go. That's the story right there. And when Rahab comes to Boaz and she's at his feet, there's there's the characters there. And now we have Mary, who's at the feet of Jesus. And so this could be a depiction of Mary, Jupiter being at the feet of Aries, which would represent Christ. We've got We've always got this theme of bowing down at the feet. Of, of Jesus, and uh, but Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, "Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me." Well, what do we have in this story? We've got two characters in this story. We've got a a Martha, and we've got a Mary. And so we got, but we've got two fish here. But Mary, this could be the Martha. This could represent the Martha. This could represent the Mary. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So in Luke 
so let's just summarize Luke 10. He's talking about lambs. He's talking about serpents. He's talking about scorpions. He's talking about traveling. He actually does mention uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in Luke 10, which I, I skipped. He's talking about the Good Samaritan on a long journey. He's talking about two people, one at the feet of Jesus. And you can kind of point at the stars as you read this. And it's like, this is really fun. So again, when you're looking at this picture in the stars, it's bringing scripture to life for me anyway. So that's fun. Okay. So the model prayer, Luke 11. This is uh, the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, say this. Our Father in heaven. Wait a second. In heaven, there's Aronis. And these are the heavens. You guys know that Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare uh, the glory of our Lord. I'm paraphrasing, but yes. The prayer goes, Our Father in heaven, Aronis, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, yeah, Christy mentioned this too, and like, um, what's happening on planet Earth might be happening on Earth, uh, in heaven at the same time. So we've got this king coronation going on uh, at the exact same time that this picture is here. And so you've got to ask the question, will we be anointing our king while the Earth is anointing their king? On Earth as it is in heaven, will this prayer come true? Your will be done on Earth as it is in heaven. It's just a question. It's not a statement. It's a very interesting question indeed. Give us day by day our daily bread. Bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He always says that. Um, at the Last Supper, He's he breaks the bread and, and offers them the wine. And he basically says, you've got to eat my body to have eternal life. And so it's in this prayer on earth as it is in heaven, give us day by day our daily bread. Here's the bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone else who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us. Where have we heard that before? Everywhere. Deliver us. It's in Psalm 18. You've delivered me from many waters. Deliver us. We're waiting for that deliverance right now. And so this prayer... We're hoping to get caught up. It really relates to what we see here in this picture. And so moving on after the Lord's Prayer, we've got a parable. And Jesus is always talking in parables. And here we are right here. Luke 11, verse 5. This is Jesus saying, And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight? First of all, that word midnight is is the first clue because in the uh, story of the the virgins, when does when does the bridegroom come? He comes at midnight. I'll read that verse, Matthew twenty five verse six. And at midnight, a cry was heard: "Behold, the bridegroom is coming! Go out and meet him." Well, who is our bridegroom? It's the lamb. The lamb is the bridegroom, and so that's our little clue that he's coming at midnight. Now, I don't know if he's actually coming at midnight. I mean, who, whose midnight is it? But that's beside the point. The word midnight is a clue. He's talking about him coming, I think, in this situation. Which of you have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. And here we are talking about bread again. He's talking about bread once again in this parable. He just can't stop talking about bread and loaves and stuff. Verse six, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, whoop, wait a second, a journey, a journey, that's second Passover. Second Passover is talking about a journey, but wait a second, didn't we just read that in the parable of the Good Samaritan? Yeah, we did. So he's using a parable again to talk about a man on a long journey. Jesus loved to talk about people traveling to and fro. Let's go back to Numbers 9 before we continue on. Numbers 9 is when they instituted the second Passover. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, this is verse, chapter 9, verse 10. If any one of you, of your posterity, is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey, he may still keep the Lord's Passover. On the 14th day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it. So that's second Passover. Funny enough, the day that 
it was instituted is in chapter 9, verse 11, when it's talking about making an official date for second Passover. That's Numbers 9, 11. What is our emergency um, code? It's it's 9, 11. If you got an emergency, you're going with 9, 11. You call 9, 11. Let's get back to the parable in Luke chapter 11. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut. Wait a second. The door. Where have I heard that before? <laughs> I've heard that all over the place in the Bible. The door. Jesus says, I am the door. He says that in Luke 10. Let me go get that. I'm sorry, John 10. Let me go get, find that. It says in John 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He's also talking about sheep right here, which again is pointing to Aries. Later on in verse 7 and in verse 9, he says that he is a door. Let me read it. Verse 7, then Jesus said to them, again, I most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Not only is he the door, he's the door of the sheep. I mean, this is looking like an Aries situation to me. And he doesn't say it just once. He says it again. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear him. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. So there's the door. Not only is he the door, he's the door of the sheep. I mean, this is screaming Aries to me. Let's go back to um, Luke once again, to that parable when a friend comes at midnight. And we know that Jesus is coming to get us. Well, actually, then before I go back to that, I just read you the door in John 10. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Hammer this point home. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door, a door standing up open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. There's your Aries horn speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And there you go. And then there's the lamb. The lamb was in that uh, throne room there. Okay. Get back to the parable. Uh, Luke. Chapter 11, verse 7. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut. Well, what we have to do now is we got to go back to Matthew 25. Because he not only comes at midnight, but that sounds really familiar, doesn't it? What happens in Matthew 25, verse 10? And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. And the door was shut. Okay, Luke 11, verse 7. Back to the parable. Do not trouble me. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give it to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friends, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs so wow that little short parable connects to revelation 4 verse 1 it connects it connects to john 10 it, it connects to matthew 25 and then that's just a short list i mean actually it, it will connect to the parable after that too in matthew 25 and uh, we know that Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats too, as well. It says that in Matthew 25. I mean, it's always pointing to the sheep. It's always There's always a sheep and a journey. Actually, I'll read that 25 verse 14 in Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. Verse 15, he went on a journey. Matthew 25 verse 33, just... For simplicity's sake, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So there's a separate separation of sheep and goats. Sheep is certainly in his um, in his wheelhouse. 
We've got that in Matthew 25. The door is shut and so on. All right. Man, I wasn't even planning on saying all of this stuff. It just came to my mind. All these little connections uh, from the just simply from the parable of a friend comes at midnight. There's a lot there. But this was where I really wanted to get to. This is what I titled the video. Luke 11, verse 9. Keep asking, keep asking, seeking, and knocking. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock. Wait a second. Knock. Well, you knock on a door. Well, who is a door? It's Jesus. I just read you Revelation 4, verse 1. There's the door. There's actually a couple door references in Revelation 3 as well when he's talking about the churches. I just read you Matthew 25. The door is shut. And here we go. Keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And who is the door? Jesus said he is the door. John 10. Verse 10 of Luke 11. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, well, you only knock on the door, it will be open. All right. So if a son asks for bread, what is it with this bread once again? We just talked about bread in the parable before it, didn't we? And what did we pray in the Father's, um, the Lord's Prayer? Bread. So we, the, the, in our prayer, it's about bread and heaven. And then in the parable, a friend comes at midnight, it's about bread. And now keep asking and seeking and knocking. If a son asks for bread, he's got this consistent theme of bread. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And there he is, Aries, the lamb. The lamb who was slain, the bread of life. You won't have eternal life unless you take the bread. All right, so if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? And we know that the stone rolled away on a resurrection day. Or if he asks for a fish, wait a second, a fish. Where's the fish? You guys know where the fish is. It's right here. Right there, there's the fish. So if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Well, here's the sea serpent. But wait a second, a serpent? He said this in Luke 10, verse 19. Behold, I gave you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. This is Luke 10, 19, when he sent out the 70. But over here, We've got the same thing again. We're talking about serpents once again. Okay, so again, Luke 11, 11. If a son asks for bread, there's the bread, where the lamb, from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or, or if he asks for a fish, there he is, there's the fish. Will he give him a serpent? There's the serpent, Cetus, instead of a fish. Or if he asks for an egg, Will he offer him a scorpion? Okay, wait a second. Okay. So he's pointed to Aries. He's pointed to Pisces. He's pointed to Cetus. And now he's pointing to the scorpion. What's going on in the scorpion? We got a full moon in scorpion. In Scorpius. Whoa. Libra. Basically, there's the full moon right in Libra. See, it says 100% here if you can see the screen. And then... Very quickly, the next day, it goes to Scorpius. So I just love reading. I, I'm really enjoying reading scripture and seeing the picture in the stars. I think it's really, really a fun thing for me. And so here's the bread. Here's the fish. Here's the serpent. And here's the scorpion. I think this is really fun. This is a very fun theme we've got going on. So now I'm just going to read that parable one more time. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, there's the door, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread, there's the bread. From any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, there's the fish. Will he give him a serpent? There's the serpent. Instead of a fish, or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? I showed you the, to the Scorpius with the full moon. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? I mean, come on now, this is a, this is fun stuff. Okay, I'm gonna have a little sip here. I like it. I like it. Um. Okay. 
so that's really, really fun. Now we've got to go to, let's see where my notes bring me now. 11, Luke 11. We're still in the Luke 10 and 11 zone. This is verse 29. This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah, the prophet. Well, Cetus is also known as the whale. It is a sea serpent. So there it is, the sign of Jonah, in my opinion. And I think that eclipse that we saw a couple weeks ago was right over the whale, the Cetus. And um, I think that would be a really good indication of this picture. For Jonah, for as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. And keep in mind, it took 40 days for Nineveh to repent. Right there's that there's that 40 again, and that that's another reason why I like this 40 year gap between 30 A.D. and 70 A.D. from the cross to the temp uh the, the destruction of the temple. So that's that. That's cool stuff there. All right. So Revelation 2, 17. Let's go over there. Talking to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. The hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. Excuse me. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So we got hidden manna to those who overcome. That's something to chew on, hidden manna. I don't know why the word hidden is in there. We know that this is a bit of a mystery, this whole escape. I don't know uh, if that's why he wrote the word hidden in here, but nevertheless, we have hidden manna, and we do have that stone. But that's what I just read in Luke 11, talking about um, the manna and the stone. Yep. Hey, Dr. B, yeah. Second month, 15th day, Exodus 16. The miracle from the skies happened on the 15th day of the second month. It's very cool. 1 Corinthians 15. Because remember in that parable, we talked about the bread and the stone and the Scorpius. Okay. Well, let's read this very, very popular um, rapture scenario over here in 1 Corinthians 15, with the stars in front of us. Okay. Let's go from 50, 15 verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. I'm going to talk to you about the hidden manna, perhaps. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, at the last trumpet, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. At the last trumpet, the first and the last trump on Aries, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your sting? Where is your sting? Where is your sting? I don't know. What do you guys think? Full moon, Scorpius, Odette, where is your sting? Does that mean we uh, we get out of here before the sting? Is, is that what this verse is kind of implying? I'm not sure. Death is swallowed up. In victory, Odette, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I got victory. Victory, hallelujah, over the enemy, glory, glory, yeah. All right, back to our picture, back to our picture. All right, so that's that. We've got Matthew 6, a lot of fun stuff here. All right, we all get stressed out. We all get anxious. We all start worrying, and what do we all default to? We default to Matthew 6. We, get, we default to Matthew 6. But there's, I think there's clues in here, guys. I think there's rapture clues in Matthew 6. When we're all going there, when we're all stressed out about life, wait a second. Are these actually rapture clues? Well, let's read them. Look 
at the birds of the air. Look at the birds of the air. Well, wait a second. Where else does he talk about birds in the air? Well, he talks about it in Song of Solomon, doesn't he? Well, let's go read it. Song of Solomon talks about doves. It says that in Song of Solomon 2, verse 1. Well, actually, sorry. One second. I didn't write it down, but I, I've got it highlighted in my... All right. Song of Solomon 1, 15. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have doves' eyes. Also in Song of Solomon 2, verse 14. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. And then another um, bird reference here in Song of Solomon 2, verse 12. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. So we've got Matthew 6, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. But that kind of points to Song of Solomon, which is the whole rapture is right. The whole theme is in chapter 2. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more than value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies. Wait a second. Consider the lilies. Okay. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Lilies, you say. Well, that's in Song of Solomon chapter 2, isn't it? I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Verse 2, like a lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Song of Solomon 2, 16. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Okay, so we got a bird reference. We've got a lily reference. I went for a walk today, and I was just actually watching all the birds flying, really listening to them a little bit more intently. And it's the, it's the season of turtle doves. It's the season of um, mating, if you will. It's the season of new life. And so 26 is pointing to Song of Solomon. 28 is pointing to Song of Solomon. I wonder if Matthew 6, verse 29, is going to point to Song of Solomon, who was written by Solomon. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wait a second. We got a Solomon reference once again. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wow. So we got a bird reference. We've got a lily reference pointing to the season and pointing to Song of Solomon. And then we, if that wasn't clear enough, we got a Solomon reference. It's called Song of Solomon. Pretty sweet stuff. Now, 1 Kings, verse 1, 6 verse 1, I'm going to get it. And it came to pass in the 418th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. And the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, it, well, here's the measurements. But basically, King Solomon builds the temple. He starts to be, build the temple in the second month. That's actually extremely exciting. I hope you guys are finding that connection really exciting. We've got this reference to birds of the air. We've got this reference to lilies. We've got, got this reference to Solomon. And Solomon builds the temple in the second month, according to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, he started to build his his temple through us, you know, the spiritual temple, if you will, in the second month, which I believe we're basically in. Okay. Right on. Okay. Later on, we know it talks about this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Matthew 7, verse 6. We're continuing on here. And 
do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, pearls was an interesting thing, too. The word pearl and pearls is not written too much in the Bible, but it is certainly in there. And there is something called pearl barley. There's something called pearl barley. And we are looking at ourselves as the barley harvest but there's something unique about pearl barley i'm going to see if i can get this article up uh oh that's not it mm, oh maybe my website oh there it is okay show on stream we're gonna to go to is this it yeah pearl barley it says according to this website is not a whole grain pearl barley has been polished or pearled to remove some or all of the outer bran layer along with the hull if it's lightly pearled, pearl barley will be tan color. If it's heavily pearled, barley will be quite white. Most of the barley found in the typical supermarket is pearl barley, although it is technically a refined grain. It's much healthier than other refined grains because some of the bran may still be present and the fiber in barley is distributed throughout the kernel. And not just in the outer bran layer, pearl barley cooks more quickly than whole grain barley. Here's one picture. It's not that great. I'm sorry, but it's basically white and it's more refined and it's the inner part of the barley itself. And um, where is that? And I don't know if I wrote it down. Where is this? The pearl. I think it's over here in Matthew 13, maybe. Okay, there it is. Okay, there it is. Pearl. Okay, so keep that in mind. Pearl barley. We're looking at ourselves as the pearl. Um, the pearl barley, the barley and the pearl. And here it is in Luke 13, verse 45 and 46. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Well, Christ sold all everything he had and bought us with his blood. And so here he is looking and he found a pearl. Pearl barley, if you will. Isn't that fun? Matthew 13, again, 45 and 46. So are we the pearl barley that he's looking for, that he paid a great price for? I don't know. I don't know, but I think it's nice. So here's the lamb. The lamb paid the price for the pearl. Is this the pearl? Are we are we the pearl that he paid the price for? He's, he just sold everything he had. Basically, he just gave everything he had for us. The next verse is the parable of the dragnet, <laughs> right after the pearl. Isn't this fun? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some fish of every kind. Then after that, there was a separation of the fish. After this whole conversation about the pearl. And as you guys know, my one of my live streams, I was talking about Matthew 14, which comes right after this. And we, we talked about Herod and, and Heroditus and and Pursuus and, and John who was beheaded. Well, it's all just above right here. here here's John the Baptist beheaded. My chains are gone. Heroditus, Herod, the theme of Herod here. And then we go into the feeding of the 5,000. So now what I'm finding here is the, the chapter before it now relates to this whole story. Now it's basically Matthew 13 and 14 comes into play it's really stacking up here a lot of fun stuff all right where else are we we've got oh yeah paul messaged me and it was really cool what he messaged me he messaged me psalm 23 verse 6 we know we're like we're in psalm 23 we're looking at a we're hoping that our escape is in 2023 and so he he sent me an email and he says the word dwell is actually related to the, the Strong's uh, number H3427, which means to marry and to bring and to tarry and to um, consummate. And so, and that kind of thing, right? So, um, let me see if is my screen still up? Am I still sharing the screen properly? Yeah, I am. So, Psalm 23, verse 6. 
says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So that word, I will dwell, another word for that is Mary. Judge, habitation, keep, bring, marrying, settle down. It usually means you're where you live. So I will live in the house of the Lord forever, but I will marry forever. That kind of that kind of theme. So thank you, Paul, for that. That was a really cool connection there. And again, that strong's number was H three four two seven. Then Nancy Anderson brought up the feeding of the four thousand in the comment section. Thank you, Nancy, for directing me in this way. This is another cool thing. Mark eight, verse nineteen. Let's see here. Okay, yeah. So here's another interesting to, thing, too. I talked about the feeding of the 5,000 for a whole live stream. The feeding of the 4,000 came after the feeding of the 5,000. There was bread and fish there as well. So again, we've got this story for a second time, and we here we are looking at second Passover. So there's there's two separate stories about the feeding of the multitude, which is amazing. There is a story at the beginning of Christ's ministry where they don't catch fish the first night, but they catch fish the second time. And at the end of Christ's ministry, they don't catch fish the first time, but they do catch fish the second time in John 21. And we have a double story. we got the feeding of the 5,000 and of the 4,000. Now, the thing that really jumped out to me was when Jesus was talking to them afterwards. And so I'll, I'll say this. This is Mark 8, verse 17 and, and on. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. So he said to them, how is it you do not understand? So he was really making it clear to point out the number 12 and the number 7. He was he was clarifying. He was recalling it to their memory to, to really clarify the 12 baskets and the 7. The 12 and the 7. The 12 and the 7. The 12 and the 7. Don't you guys get it? The 12 and the 7. Well, let's go to Luke now. Luke chapter 2. And... Again, remember I told you the 12 and the 7, the 12 and the 7, the 12 and the 7. Okay, well, what's 12 times 7? It's it's 84. Okay, so remember those two numbers, 12, 7, and 84. 12, 7, and 84. 12, 7, and 84. Okay. I'm going to read Luke chapter 2. Now, there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel. The daughter of Phanuel. What does Phanuel mean? The daughter of Phanuel means the face of God. So here's Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of the face of God, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, and she lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And the woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers that night and day and coming in that instant she gave thanks to the lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in jerusalem so we got the seven number we got the 84 but continuing on in this chapter we're, we're, we're going to find the 12 we're going to find the number 12 so again the feeding of the the 4000 jesus was really really adamant on a clarifying that there's a seven and there's a 12 seven and 12 but now what I'm reading you here is Anna. It said there were seven years from her virginity, and this woman was a widow of 84 years. Seven times 12 is 84. We're going to read a couple verses down, and we're going to hit the 12. Okay, you ready? Verse 39. So when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he had, when he was 12 years old, oh, oh, 12, okay. They went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. 
when they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behold, behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey. There's the word journey again. They were on a long journey. They left Jesus when he was 12 years old at the temple, and they had to come back. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. We know the rest of the story. But we have, just like in Matthew, um, where did I read? The, Mark 8. We, Jesus was making it clear. Don't you guys get it? The 12 and the 7, the 12 and the 7, the 12 and the 7. Now we're in Luke chapter 2. We've got the 12 and the 7 and the 84. Now, at the beginning of this video, what did I say about Aranus? It's in the heel of Aries perfectly every 84 years. Aranus is in the heel of Aries perfectly every 84 years without fail. It's there all the time. Jupiter has a 12-year cycle. More or less, it's, it's more or less in the same spot every 12 years. And so Anna, in the book of Luke, chapter 2, is following the pattern of Uranus. And the 12 is, 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 is the Jupiter theme here. Okay, and then we've got 7 times 12. We know that 7 is a huge number. We're waiting for 7 years of this tribulation. And all those numbers fit this whole picture seamlessly. It's, it's really a, an incredible thing. And we are sort of represented through Anna as in a generation that is waiting. Actually, it's, it's Simeon as well, just before Anna in this story that was literally waiting to see uh, Jesus. And, and he did in, in Luke chapter 2. And um, it, it says, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. So Simeon and Anna were essentially both waiting to see Jesus. And so Aranus hasn't been in this position since before Israel became a nation. Back in 19, well, this the last time Aranus was here was, I think, 1939 or whatever, 1938, 39, that kind of thing. And so now Anna being connected with this Aranus pattern is quite remarkable uh, with the 84 connection here. So that's really great. Luke 24, verse 30. Let's go there. What did I write here? What, what was I trying to say? Oh, yeah. The bread. The bread. Now, after the road to uh, uh, Emmaus, 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 sorry, um, they didn't know it was Jesus. They didn't recognize him right there, walking and talking with him, but they didn't really see that it was him. But how did they recognize him? Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. They knew him, and he vanished from their sight. So it was the bread, and then they, their eyes were opened. And here we are, just waiting to see Jesus, and, and he is the bread of life. And here's the bread connection there. A few verses later in Luke 24, one of the last things it says in verse 35 here, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. In the breaking of bread. So thank you for leaving that comment, Crystal. You kind of pointed me in the study here. So that thank you for that. Luke 24, verse 42, continuing on in the same chapter. So they gave him, because Jesus said, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. So they're talking about bread and fish at the end of Luke 24. And again, Pisces, the fish, Aries, the bread, the lamb walking around with them. I mean, come on, come on. Can't get any better than that. Come on, come on, stay in. Okay, Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. This was really fun. I mentioned this on Brother John's. Uh, live stream the other day. Here's a miscellaneous law, a very random miscellaneous law in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. 
this was a verse that was found by Brother John. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year. One year. And bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. All right. So we're again, we're looking at this picture. We're looking at this picture. Here's the fun part with this picture in the stars. Here's us. Here's Jesus who's taking his wife, his bride, hopefully very soon. Here's Taurus, which represents bad news. Here's Aries, that represents good news. If you put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, you shall be saved. The death angel will pass over you. If you don't have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, you are in trouble. Tribulations coming your way. You've got to get tight with Christ if you're listening to this video and you do not have a relationship with him. Believe that he died on the cross for you. Please, please, please. So, anyway, Jupiter, if that's us, and I just read you Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, when a man goes, he, he's going to make his wife happy for one year before going out to war. If you follow Jupiter for one year, exactly, Jupiter is underneath the protection of Aries for one year, pretty much almost to the week, to the day, before it enters into Taurus, which represents, I believe, the judgment. So there we go. Now it's in Taurus, uh, one year later. One year later, and it goes through the protection of Aries, and that really, really fulfills Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, really, really well. If we're out of here, right here, almost exactly one year later, Jupiter is in Taurus. And so, again, I, I need to address that that eclipse that's in 2024, which I think it's around the 8th here. We're going to lock it in here. And I think that this eclipse is certainly something that we can't ignore. But I think this is for uh, the final judgment, the left behind. I think this is bad news, Bear, for the people that are left over, left behind, so to speak. I don't, at the moment, I can't, I don't see this as a rapture sign. I see this as you're in trouble. This is bad news. See, Jupiter's almost in uh, Taurus at this point, the judgment scales. Now, of course, if we're here at that time, we'll look at this as a rapture sign maybe, but at, at this point, I don't see it as a rapture sign. This is in what I would consider the left behind fish. This is the fish that would be facing um, the throne room. And so I like I like our situation right now more, not 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 even because the our situation right now is simply a couple days in front of us. I just genuinely, genuinely like this picture way more of Jupiter right here in that caught up fish. And um, this is the best gate, in my opinion, and uh, many others that it, just facing the throne room here. And again, I, I should have read this earlier, and I don't think I did, but it talks about the narrow gate. And it, it mentioned it right after um, the parable that I was reading. Now, where is the narrow gate passage? There it is. So right after keep asking, seeking, and knocking in Matthew 7. So I started off with reading it from Luke, but I'll read it from Matthew 7. In fact, I don't think I read it from Matthew 7 yet. No, I didn't. So that's perfect. That's why I didn't say it yet. Okay. So Matthew 7, verse 7. Go, Jesus, go. Yeah, I like it, Uncle Fester. Yeah, let's go. I can't wait to cheer uh, Jesus on to finish his work. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, yeah, Jupiter. Ju Peter? Hey, Ju Peter. I know. I know. You're right. That sounds fun. Okay, Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, which, again, is connected with Aries, the door, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, which is the door there, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, there's a lamb, there's the Aries, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, there is the fish, Pisces. Will he give him a serpent? There's a serpent, Cetus. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven, Aranus, give good things 
to those who ask, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophet. Now, the next parable is the narrow way. Enter by the narrow gate. But we were these constellations are known as gates as well. And, and this could be considered, you know, gate one, for example, gate two, gate three, gate four, etc. Right? We have about 12 main constellations that all these um, moving planets or moving stars go through. And so here's Jupiter in this narrow gate. And I can't just now I can't help to read the narrow way as a looking at this picture in the stars. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by in it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And so there you go. There is a narrow way. I hope hopefully you guys are seeing and understanding what I I'm just seeing here. I we're certainly just guessing at the timing here, so don't don't sell the farm. Don't sell. Uh, the car don't give your two weeks notice to your to your boss here um but um i think this is a really really fun situation i um i'll be looking at this weekend real big and um i i might have more studies coming we're certainly going to have a fun live stream at some point maybe closer to the date i don't know but i i hope this study blessed you I, I was one of those things where I was just studying and reading today and like, oh man, I, I really just got to get on there and do a live stream and just share this stuff before my mind goes in circles and I, you know, I lose what I was, my, my train of thought. So, um, yes, make sure you get into a relationship with Jesus Christ, guys. Get tight with that, the big man, because he's coming. We are running out of time for this all to make sense. There are too many signs too, too, too many signs to ignore. Um, thank you guys for all your comments and your support and your love. And I'm going to leave it with that. I, I would love people to really uh, watch this video. So share it if, uh, if you feel like to do that. And um, I think moving forward, I just love to read the Bible now with the stars in, in front of my screen here and just kind of make the connections. I think it's really great. So I encourage you guys to do the same thing. Look up. It says in Luke 21, verse 25. I'll, I'll, I'll read you that verse. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity in the sea and the waves roaring. Verse 28, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And here we are literally like literally looking up at the skies and reading our Bible and waiting for the big man to open the clouds, just like he did in Exodus 16 and to rain our spiritual bread from heaven. We're waiting for that Exodus 16 moment, Exodus 16, verse 10. I'm going to read that too. 16, verse 10. Let's do that. Now it came to pass. This is, this is, uh, well, 16 verse 1, it says the 15th day of the second month, pointing to second Passover. But in verse 10, it says, Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke um, to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Oh, we are waiting for Jesus, the glory of the Lord, to appear in the cloud. I'll read it again. Now it came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. It's exactly what we're waiting for, guys. You guys are all probably making the connections that I am now. I really hope you are. Isn't that a beautiful thing that the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Woo! God bless, guys. Make sure you eat your bread, eat, eat your manna, read your word. Go, Jesus, go. Love you.